So yeah, first of all, I just want to welcome everybody who's joining us for this info session from various places. And uh, it's kind of weird to give present this information without seeing people's faces and have you all in a circle together. Um, but regardless, welcome and excited to have you here for the next little bit to talk about this course and possibilities going forward. Um, so I wanted to start with a little story, actually. Um, and it involves a bird that uh, is pretty common in city areas, actually. And uh, not many people are typically aware of this bird. Um, and it's called a Cooper's Hawk. And it makes its living eating other birds. So it's kind of, it has a really strong presence in the bird world because everything needs to know where these birds are if they want to live. Um, so I was walking down the street right here in downtown Ithaca with Tim and uh, our office manager, Sarah Jane, and we're walking towards Gimme Coffee, and suddenly this Cooper's Hawk swoops in and lands on a branch right a couple houses in front of this house with a bird feeder and lots of squirrels. And uh, we got to stop and notice it for, you know, a couple minutes there and uh, hear a downy woodpecker that was given an alarm call and all the were frozen. Um, and it really just, I wanted to bring that up because it, uh, it makes me have gratitude for nature being kind of at our fingertips all over the place. It's just our choice to tune in and pay attention. Um, so yeah, grateful that we have the chance to have stories like that and grateful that we get to bring in people like you guys to share in some of those experiences. So the way this presentation is gonna look is we've got a Prezi presentation that goes over a lot of the aspects of the course and you all can ask questions by typing them in if you want throughout. And uh, yeah, then at the end, there'll be a chance for more questions as well. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to actually go ahead and mute everyone who's on the call just so that there's um, no background noise coming into it. So if you do have questions, you can ask them by typing them in and uh, we'll see them and we'll either answer them in the moment or get back to you guys on them. All right, so the Wilderness Skills Intensive. Um, that's the title of this course and it's definitely an intensive course and uh, it's one of my favorite ones to teach here at Primitive Pursuits. Um, we'd like to start with this quote, and the quote, I'll read it to you, is, uh, this program was one of the best experiences of my life. It has caused me to reevaluate my professional and personal priorities. And that quote would be pretty powerful no matter who it came from, but the reason we like to share it here is because that actually came from a professor at Ithaca College who some of you might know, Jason Hamilton, who's a double PhD in plant biochemistry and all sorts of other crazy academic stuff. And, uh, yeah, it kind of just shows that there's there's a whole other realm out there um, besides the academic realm. And it's really pretty amazing that someone as accomplished as Jason had such a profound experience with this kind of material in this course. So we like to say that the course is broken up into um, cool, three different categories. We have um, primitive technology as the first one. So within primitive technology, we look at primitive technologies as skills to help us meet our basic needs out on the landscape. So if you look at our ancestors and hunter-gatherer societies, these are the skills that are just ingrained in the culture. And they're kind of skills that we have lost, like how to make fire by rubbing sticks together and wild edible plants and tracking and that kind of knowledge. So we like to start with fire and we do a lot with fire and this is a picture of the hand drill friction fire technique um, the bow drill is one that you guys will get a lot of experience at and there's nothing quite like seeing somebody get their first friction fire because you get an ember from rubbing the sticks together and you put it in a tinder bundle and you can just see on her face there that it's just magic and it's one of my favorite things sharing that experience with participants so shelter is another aspect of primitive technology, primitive skills that we're gonna cover. And um, like with all the skills we cover, we really do this by getting 
our hands in on it. We're not really gonna, you know, talk about it and draw it up on a whiteboard. We're gonna go out there and spend the night camping and just bring a sleeping bag and no tent and have to build a shelter. And uh, the opportunity may be there to sleep out in a shelter without a sleeping bag, because that's possible if you build your shelter. Right. So we'll look at shelters like the Debris Hut, which is an amazing shelter to keep you warm no matter the temperature, without a sleeping bag, without a fire, without anything. We'll also look at some other shelter techniques like thatching. And this picture is actually from Grassroots Festival where we build this big structure every year and we weave these cattail mats um, on this giant loom and then put them all together. And it's not quite um, a survival skill, as I'll say. Like if you're out there just trying to survive, you probably wouldn't be making a big thatched hut, but it's a really cool skill to connect to the landscape in a way that uh, we can make some longer term things. And I guess, I'll take the opportunity right now to make the distinction. Um, a lot of people are looking for survival skills and we kind of don't like that word that much because it implies that there's kind of this, this struggle and this separation and that it's going out there to survive, to make it back to civilization. And our goal is really to connect people to this place. You know, I like to think about it. If you look at a deer that's out there, um, I wouldn't consider a deer on survival. A deer just lives and it knows how it fits into the ecosystem. It knows where to find food, where to find shelter and how to be. And sometimes a lean winter, some of the deer might starve, but the deer are out there in relationship with the natural world in a really pure, basic way. And my feeling is that that is our birthright. We're of this earth, just like the squirrels and the deer. And learning all these skills helps us reclaim that and reclaim that connection um, and feel comfortable out there providing for our needs. But uh, we're definitely not learning this stuff so we can run away and live alone in the woods. We're doing this stuff so that we can connect more deeply and lead other people to uh, share in the natural world as well. So we even will make shelters from snow. And for the early track participants, which actually starts in March, early March, um, there will likely be snow on the ground for our first camp out, which is the second week of class. And this picture here has a pretty cool story associated with it, actually. There's a longtime student of Primitive Pursuits who started with Tim and Jed when she was young. And she'd been doing this stuff for so long that it was really no longer an edge for her to build a snow shelter and sleep in it, even without a sleeping bag. Um, and part of what we'd like to do here with all our programs, and especially the intensive, is help bring people towards their edge, whatever that might be, in a safe way so that people can grow. So for her, in this particular camp, but everyone else is building their snow caves, and uh, so they had her build this fire, and the fire that you see burning in the middle, she lit that with a bow drill collected off the landscape that day, made with just her knife. And uh, so Tim and Jed were leading this camp out with her, and right at about 40 minutes till sunset, they said, that's when they said, okay, go ahead, build your shelter. And uh, they didn't really know how it was gonna go either, but they knew that she had the skills to do it. And uh, having been around this stuff so much, she looked around, did a little bit of scouting. And if you can see where my mouse is, um, right in between the two shelters, she realized that she could just build her shelter there and three quarters of the work was already done. So she piled up sticks there, made a nice bed and then covered it with snow and uh, spent the night just fine in a shelter right there. Um, and it's pretty cool just to see how far you can take this. Like I really love working with some of our homeschoolers who some of them have been doing this with primitive pursuits once a week for five, 10 years even. And it's pretty cool the, the depth of connection and awareness that happens when people have been doing this stuff for a while. Um, so I'm seeing some people just joined us and uh, if you're just joining us, that's just fine. Um, you can catch right up with, with where we're at. So another part of practicing primitive technologies is ancestral crafts. And uh, I'd like to ask the question, especially when you guys are in person, um, how many of you guys used a container of some sort today? And uh, we kind of take it for granted a lot in modern culture, um, containers, because we've got Tupperware, plastic bags, backpacks, all sorts of things that uh, if we actually had to make those things, we might appreciate them a little bit more. So containers are a pretty amazing thing to learn how to make in the natural environment. And uh, you'll see in the picture here, there's a gourd, there's a piece of wood that was made by coal burning. 
there's bark for baskets that's white pine i think and that looks like white ash there's even rawhide so uh lots of containers and stuff to put in the containers too um natural fiber is a similar one to containers uh, when you ask people how many of them used rope or something today most people are wearing natural fiber on their body right now with the clothes we wear or whatever it might be and uh you don't really appreciate rope until you have to make it your own. It's one thing to have a 500 foot spool of paracord and setting up tarps out in the woods, but if you have to make your own cordage from, uh, oh, whether it's basswood or dog vein fibers, then you definitely appreciate it a little bit more. So we're definitely gonna learn how to make rope and play with it. And there's a cool fiber pictured here too. Um, and you guys know what that is. It's, uh, I consider it one of the strongest natural fibers and it actually it comes from an animal um maybe we'll play with some of that too it is deeply meaningful for me the skills and ways of life you are practicing and teaching and i've been wanting to do this for a long while that is a quote from a wilderness skills intensive apprentice and we like to share it because um, I really see the stuff that we teach our curriculum as speaking to everybody. It's, it's our shared ancestry and it's what it means to connect with this land that we live on. And some people um, who may not have grown up this way or been exposed to it um, feel like it's too late or whatever it might be. And uh, it just, this stuff can be life changing no matter when you choose to learn it. Um, just today, I interviewed someone for the Wilderness Intensive who is um, over 60 years old, and hopefully she's going to join us for the early track. And she was just, yeah, it's going to be a really awesome addition to the group, bringing that perspective. Um, yeah. So I see a question here. Can you use any of those, any bark for making those containers? And I'll say um, certain types of bark peel from the tree differently. And different times of year will allow for peeling bark differently too. So there's some trees like white pine that really are one of our favorites because we can peel them any season of the year. And there's others like white ash that um, take certain, uh, certain cues in the time of year of when it's going to peel the best. And then there's certain trees like, oh, maybe service berry, for example, that just the bark probably, even if it did peel, wouldn't be very good for a craft regardless. So yeah, there's a lot to dive into, and I'd recommend uh, starting to learn trees through that lens of uh, yeah, how you can utilize them and how they change through the seasons. So I said the course is broken into three main categories. The first is primitive technologies, and the next is naturalist knowledge. And if you think back to what it might have looked like to be in a native village or um, how our ancestors grew up, um, where there were elders and people really passing this knowledge along, um, it can seem like we don't have that today and it can be, um, it can be sad and difficult, but uh, we like to look at um, field guides as the elders of the work that we do. And if you really think about all of the, the countless hours and literally lifetimes of knowledge that are in these books, it really is like having an elder at your fingertips. So we might not have the same um, physical elders to uh, mentor us along this path, but we have a lot of resources. So we're going to learn a lot of naturalist knowledge through looking at field guides and asking questions and sharing mysteries with each other. Um, so mammal studies is definitely something we'll look at. Um, there's not terribly many mammals around here, so it's good to get to know each of them. And uh, that's actually a really cool skull in the picture right here. If anybody thinks they know what it is, they can, uh, they can type uh, what they think it might be. And I might not give you the answer either. Um, something that we like to do is um, help people engage with curiosity through questions. So I know for me, when I'm walking through the woods with Tim or Jed or anyone, I usually don't even ask questions anymore because I know if they just give me the answer, um, I'm probably going to forget it because I've forgotten it so many times. It's really about the journey towards learning it. So raccoon, I'll tell you, it's not a raccoon. Um, and there's some characteristics like if you guys see this ridge right here, that's called the sagittal crest. 
and it's where the muscles will attach to that help power the jaw. So you can tell by that that this animal has a really strong jaw. And it's tough from this perspective too to make uh, distinctions. It's an animal that's native around here and uh, we start seeing their tracks this time of year quite a bit if you're lucky. It's not an opossum either, um, but opossums do have pretty scary looking teeth actually. They're a pretty serious carnivore. Um, so you can keep throwing out ideas if you want, but I'm gonna move on to the next slide and that's a uh, tree identification. And the trees are one of our biggest teachers out on the landscape during the wilderness skills intensive. Um, from the start, we get to know the trees. And if you're with us during the early track, we're getting to know the trees without their leaves on them, which makes it even more tricky. Um, but trees are really great to learn because they're ecological indicators. Um, certain, the presence of species of trees lets us know what else we might find in that area. And trees themselves are such an amazing resource, whether it be for their wood for making friction fire, bows and arrows, or baskets, or other crafts, um, or the nuts that they produce, like the hickory nuts, the black walnuts, which we can use for food, for dye, the acorns. There's just so much there. So learning the trees of our area is a really awesome journey. And this picture actually has another story about that same girl who her name's Lily. And we do this activity sometimes where what we'll do is we'll partner people up and one partner will have a blindfold on and they'll be led to a tree by the partner in a kind of a circuitous way. They'll get to feel the tree and then they'll be led back and then they take their blindfold off and have to go find that tree. So it's about connecting with our other senses than sight. And uh, so this girl, Lily, that she'd done that before plenty of times and it wasn't really an edge for her. So what Tim did is he put a blindfold on her and uh, said, all right, I want you to go find a service berry tree. And if you guys are familiar with trees at all, service berry is not the most common tree in the forests around here. And more so, it's kind of nondescript. It doesn't have the texture bark that maybe a hickory or an oak would have and uh, kind of tricky to find. But he said he saw her walking through the woods and putting her hands on trees and then Five minutes later, she was standing at a service berry and, and knew it. And he said he asked her what were the first five trees she passed. And she was able to list them all off, a white pine, a red oak, and know exactly what they were. Um, so I was to share that just because it, it, again, shows the, the depth where this can go of uh, knowing the trees and connecting with them in such a deep way, way more than just knowing the Latin name of a tree. So another aspect of naturalist knowledge is edible and medicinal plants and kind of with any aspect of our curriculum you could spend a whole month just doing this and still be scratching the surface and uh, oh there's some year-long programs out there that go into this so what we like to do is tackle this just like we do everything else and it's hands-on experiential every day we're going to meet at a different location and that location will have different plants different ecosystem different things to harvest different things to experience so edible plants is really going to be a journey of just getting your hands on it and putting it in your mouth and eating it and learning how to do it in a safe way too. So always cross-referencing and learning how to use field guides as a way to basically learn how to keep learning. Um, we like to make sure that everybody has the tools that they need to be able to learn this stuff on their own because that's what's really important um, rather than just knowing every plant is uh, having the ability to learn your area through this lens. So if you move somewhere else, you could lead yourself on this journey. Bird language is another one of those skills that like edible medicinal plants, it's, we just scratch the surface of it and there's really so much there. I really recommend if, uh, if you're interested in bird language more, you check out someone called John Young who has some amazing books and audio tapes on bird language. But bird language is, the um, looking at the forest through the lens of everything being connected and when something moves it affects everything else so it's on a very scientific level it's um, law of conservation of energy um, so everything out there is trying to make a living and energy in the natural world is pretty hard to come by um, i actually experienced that pretty firsthand i my roommate and i this september did a month of all wild foods and uh eating only wild foods. It was hard to get a lot of calories. We kind of take for granted getting a scoop of peanut butter out of the fridge and being good to go. Um, so I got a kind of a peek of what it's like to be 
um, really fighting for calories. And uh, we didn't waste any energy during that month because we didn't have energy to burn. So if we were actually in the woods and, you know, say we were a chickadee and there's a Cooper's hawk out there that can eat us. And there's also a weasel out there that can eat us and a house cat that can eat us. It's really important to be paying attention the whole time. So for us, we can tune into what the birds are tuning into and start to see how those patterns play out in the woods. And uh, it has some pretty cool implications tuning into this about how far we can stretch our awareness. And uh, yeah, it's definitely something that we'll touch into and get to experience, but it's definitely a lifetime experience to uh, keep following. So we have primitive technologies, we have naturalist skills, and then mentoring as the last of the three main categories. And if you look at our curriculum, um, it's not like we're going to say, all right, today we're learning primitive technologies and tomorrow we're learning mentoring. And then the next day we're doing naturalist skills. They're all kind of woven together throughout every single day, um, which is really one of my favorite parts of the course, because you really get to be a participant full time where you're just in the flow of the day and feeling it and experiencing what it's like to be out there timelessly on the land being guided towards different mysteries and learning new things and then what we'll do too is kind of step back and pull back the veil and say all right this is what we were doing this is how we were doing it and this is how you can do it with a group yourself so starting to bring transparency to those techniques that were kind of just ingrained with our ancestors that mentoring um, we also call it the invisible school if you look at native cultures the kids don't go to school, yet somehow, as they grow up, they have a tremendous knowledge of place um, that was passed on to them, and almost to the point where it surpasses scientific knowledge, like the knowledge that these Bushmen have of the place that they live in is really astounding. Um, so we try and bring transparency to what it is that allows that kind of information to pass along, and you know, it's not having the class sit there and take notes while we talk. It's engaging people through all of their senses so we'll share skills with that um, a lot of storytelling if you look at native cultures there's storytelling as a, a huge part of the culture and we like to inspire kids with stories and uh, share stories of our own and yeah stories are a really amazing tool for mentoring and games to anything where people can get some adrenaline and have an emotional reaction and be able to be running and jumping and diving. Um, we can see it with kids really clearly. And with us, a lot of participants really love the fact that they get to feel like a kid again. And we're going to be out there playing games out on the land. And it's just an absolute blast. So all of that amounts to the Wilderness Skills Instructor Certification. Um, and there are two tracks to the Wilderness Skills Intensive. Um, there's the early track, which starts March 4th, and it runs every Friday for 16 weeks, um, from my Friday, March 4th, till June 17th. And uh, so both tracks are actually the same curriculum. They're just the differences in the scheduling of them for logistics for people who are local or traveling to be here or can take Fridays or, um, yeah. So the early track is really exciting because we get time in between when we meet to really integrate these skills and what we've learned and come back together as a group and experience the the flow of the seasons we start out our first camp out has snow on the ground and we're likely building a snow shelter all the way up till excuse me um june when we have our final overnight uh, out on the lake and it's really awesome and the fast track or the late track here is four days a week um, from mid-May to mid-June. So that one typically works well with a college schedule because it's after the semester has ended and it's a great way to um, start out a summer of maybe working for us or whatever that may look like. So one thing I'll say too is um, the Wilderness Skills Intensive is an awesome way to get connected with primitive pursuits through the lens of employment. It obviously doesn't guarantee a job with us, but um, a lot of people from the course have gone on to work with us, whether it be for the summer or for internships or for year-round employment. I took the course four years ago now, and uh, yeah, I'm really grateful that I did. So the fast track is um, will be Tuesday through Friday, starting mid-May, 
and the, the exact dates of these will be emailed to you guys all tomorrow. We have a list of the course details, which we'll send out to you. So don't worry if you don't have it in front of you right now, um, you'll be able to have that. And it's accessible on our website too. So with the late track or the fast track, um, it's really a bit more immersive because we're there four days a week and covering the same stuff. So it moves quicker. And it's during a time of the year when things are in explosive growth. So there's more plants, more wild edibles. And uh, yeah, both tracks have their benefits and drawbacks. So why take the intensive? Um, so a lot of people want to know what this will do for them. And there's some people who come and take the course who are simply looking to deepen their connection to nature and um, broaden their skill set. And there's other people who are taking it who want to be environmental educators. And uh, we've had a fair amount of parents of children of our programs take it who have seen their kids have so much fun over the years and now they want to get in on it and they want to be um, mentors in their families and their community. So there's a lot of different people coming from different lenses um, to the course. But with the intensive, it is really a great way to jumpstart a career in a growing field of um, outdoor education and nature connection through, there's over a hundred wilderness schools and outdoor schools in the country now, and that's a growing field for sure. Um, it's actually pretty exciting that there's so many around. I mean, just in New York State, there's quite a few. And uh, it's really a mission that we believe in, so it's awesome to have so many popping up. Um, if you're studying in college, it uh, is a great supplement to whatever degree program you're doing. I know that when I was, I went to school for conservation biology at SUNY ESF, and the experiential education part was always what I felt was missing. And uh, a course like this can really just add so much depth to you know, taking a botany class, taking a herpetology class, taking a dendrology class, because it really allows for a broader lens and deeper connection of looking at the woods, you know, rather than just learning scientific names. Um, it's a great way to enter the field of experiential education, because that's exactly what we do and what we believe in. And lastly, the certificate will look great hanging on the wall of your debris hut. Um, and it's kind of a joke, but it's uh, hopefully you'll have your own debris hut that uh, you'll visit and spend some time in. So I'm actually going to back it up a slide. And I'm going to pass the microphone off to Tim for a second, who is going to say a few words about um, what it means to take the course and, uh, yeah, what, uh, what the next steps would look like for being part of it. Um, so yeah, here's Tim. Thanks uh, again, everybody, for being on tonight. And if you're listening to this uh, recording sometime later, that's great, too. Um, so, yeah, I think Justin did a great job laying out the foundation uh, of the course. Of course, uh, would be great to be sitting in a room with you all to be able to do some questions and answers in that format. But um, a few questions that I believe might be on some people's mind. Uh, I know that when I look at kind of making big decisions in my life or, or taking part of an in intensive courses like this, these are kind of the things that cross my mind. So um, basically, first question is you may be asking yourself is, is this right for you? Is this the right um, course? And, and what I can say is uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but if you're asking that question, then, then you're, you're definitely in the running. Uh, we, we like people who are intentional. Uh, we want people to be um, self-directed. We're there to assist and to help with that process of learning, but we we are, you know, acting as mentors and guides in a process. Uh, so is this right for you? Um, if you like having uh, challenges put forth that help you to grow quickly and fast with a caring group of uh, individuals to help you in that process, then I'd say that's a great uh, start. If you like being outdoors and exploring kind of uncharted territories, um, we're here in the Finger Lakes, so if you're from here, you know the area. If you're from someplace else in the country, um, you know, take a look at the Finger Lakes in, in uh, upstate New York. It's a beautiful location, and, and each week will be, or day, depending on the course you're in, we'll be bouncing around to different natural areas, exploring uh, kind of the best that the land has to offer here. So um, is it right for you uh, if you're looking for kind of a either to push your skill sets or to learn new skill sets or to um, kind of just challenge the status quo. 
perhaps of the direction life is uh, currently taking you. Those are all great reasons to come. Uh, is it the right time for you to be here might be another question. Um, honestly, people will look at courses like this, including this course for years, trying to decide if it's the right time. Again, what I'd say is you're going to have to do a little self-analysis, think about what it is that you're trying to achieve and where you want to go, make that decision on your own. But we are we are here to help uh, if we can uh, in that conversation. And, and finally, can you make this happen? Can you pull this off? So uh, again, 17 years into uh, running courses like this and uh, facilitating the growth of a program uh, such as Primitive Pursuits, which you know works with preschoolers through college students into retirees, uh, a large program. And, and there's many times when the question has come up, can we pull this off? And basically, uh, the answer is, we course we can. We we dig in, we make it work. It doesn't mean there's not challenges to overcome. So we invite you again to have a conversation with us if there's something that feels like it may be uh, in the way of making this possible. Um, that could be uh, time, it could be location, it could be finances. Um, whatever those are, uh, we invite you to uh, fill out an application, to get in touch with us, and and let us help you uh, along that journey. So the, the cost for this course, uh, it's a 150 hour class, uh, whether you're doing the early track or fast track, and uh, it's $1,450 for this year's course. Um, there are a small number of scholarships uh, available. So if that is something that uh, might be a stopping point for you, please do um, you know, connect with us about that. But basically, um, the process moving forward from here, if you're listening to this call and you want to take the next step, is um, if you don't receive the course details uh, from us directly via email, reach out to us, ask for them. There's an application process. We want to be able to make sure that everyone's going to get from this what they're looking to get, what they want from it, and that, that's the time when we can answer a lot of those questions. So you can go out ahead and fill out the uh, interest form. Um, we can send you uh, a link or post that here, but it's also available at primitivepursuits.com uh, and you can check that out. Um, I think I'll leave it at, at that for now. And before we fully sign off for the night, a couple of things we wanna do is, is uh, we're gonna stop the recording here shortly to be able to do kind of an informal question and answer session. But um, before even that, I, I do want Justin to take a second to introduce to you um, something that's uh, also really exciting to us uh, if you feel like a month-long course or 150 hours is exciting, but you're looking for more like a year-long program, uh, we have that too. So I'm going to turn it back over to Justin. Cool. Thanks, Tim. So yeah, like Tim said, um, if you want more, we are introducing the Wilderness Year starting this fall. Um, it's going to be a nine-month adult residential program, and uh, we'll meet three days a week. And it is, I think it's 650 hours of total instruction time. It's going to include several campouts, a week-long survival trip. Um, and it's just, I'm so excited about it. We are going to be at a property. Um, yeah, Arnott Forest is a Cornell-owned property, which has a campus on it with um, winterized cabins and a lodge area. And people have the opportunity to rent a cabin on site and live there. And it's really going to be an amazing platform to dive into all of our curriculum even deeper. So we teach a lot of um, intense, intensive classes like bow making and flint napping and hide tanning, which don't quite fit into the wilderness skills intensive, because if we were to make a bow, it would take three or four days, which is, you know, a, almost a quarter of our time together. And in looking at the scope of the intensive and what we want to accomplish, it doesn't necessarily fit those goals. But with the wilderness year, we're going to be able to really take the time to be with the natural world throughout the seasons and learn the natural history by harvesting and wandering and crafting and making a bow and arrow, tanning a deer skin start to finish, making a pack basket with black ash, and just being able to be in community and inspire each other on this path of learning everything we can about our place. And uh, you can see some of our curriculum laid out here, survival and wilderness living, the naturalist studies, um, a lot of tracking will be part of it. Leadership, mentoring, and community is going to be huge ethnobotany and caretaking and bird language and awareness. So if that speaks to you, definitely check that out on our website too.
Yeah, so finding more information about the Wilderness Year on our website under Adult Programs, you'll see a tab for Wilderness Year. And, uh, yep, you can get the curriculum on there. And uh, always feel free to email or call and uh, happy to connect in person about that, too. So with that, um, I guess we'll stop the recording and I'll unmute everybody who's here. So if uh, you're still with us and want to ask some questions, um, you're welcome to do that. And I guess I just want to end before that with thanking all of you for taking the time to be here and to, yeah, look at this as an opportunity because if it's the right thing, we'd love to have you going forward.